Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Distinguished guests, speakers, and participants, ladies and gentlemen, a very good morning, afternoon, and evening to all of you, wherever you are. On behalf of the General Council for Islamic Banks and Financial Institutions, I have the honor and pleasure of welcoming all of you today to this webinar on unveiling the Sibafi Greenhouse Gas Measurement Tool to strengthen the contribution of Islamic financial institutions to climate action. Ladies and gentlemen, in line with Sibafi's commitment to enhancing the role of Islamic financial uh, services in promoting sustainability and addressing global uh, climate related risks, today's webinar marks the uh, inauguration of the Sibafi Greenhouse Gas Measurement Tool specifically designed for Islamic banks. This uh, tool represents a significant milestone in our collective journey towards environmental responsibility. It will empower Islamic banks to evaluate the GHG emissions associated with their uh, financing and investment portfolio, providing them with valuable insights into the environmental impact. Throughout this session, our distinguished panel of speakers uh, representing diverse expertise in the field will highlight the critical role of Islamic banks in driving climate action forward. They will underscore how the adoption of this methodology marks the initial step in this progressive journey toward a more sustainable future. Ladies and gentlemen, before we start, we would like to make a couple of announcements. If you have any questions uh, throughout the webinar, please do not hesitate to write them in the chat or Q&A section that appears on the top of the screen, and we will try our best to answer these questions as much as we can. The webinar will be recorded and posted on Sibafi's social media platforms in the coming days. Uh, this webinar is also uh, live streamed on YouTube. We will also appreciate your kind feedback on the organization of the webinar by filling out the evaluation form for the webinar. Now, without further ado, I have the pleasure to call upon Dr. Abdel Ilah Belatiq, Secretary General of Sibafi, to deliver his welcoming remarks. Dr. Belatiq, the cloud is yours. Thank you, Ashid. Distinguished guests, dear colleagues, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah wa barakatuh. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening to you wherever you are. Welcome to this uh, highly anticipated webinar where Sibafi unveils the Greenhouse Gas Measurement Tool, which is an important initiative aimed at enhancing the role of Islamic financial institutions in addressing climate change. I'm honored to be with you today to mark this significant milestone in our journey towards sustainability. At Sibafi, our commitment to sustainability is unwavering and contains different projects and aspects. This webinar not only introduces a vital tool for GHG measurement, but also serves as a platform to discuss the broader implications of our efforts in integrating sustainability within the Islamic financial sector. The launch of this tool is the result of a collaborative and inclusive process, bringing together the expertise and insights of various stakeholders, including our esteemed members, regulatory bodies and industry experts. Over the years, Sibafi has launched several initiatives that underscore our dedication to this cause. In 2022, indeed, we issued the Sustainability Guide, which provided our members with comprehensive frameworks and best practices to embed sustainability into their operations. In addition to the guide, we are very pleased to announce the launch of, of a new training certification on sustainability and related product development this month. This certification program is designed to equip professionals with the knowledge and skills necessary to develop sustainable financial products that align with both Sharia principles and global sustainability uh, standards. Our projects, they go hand in hand, uh, complementing each other. Today's launch of the GHG measurement tool is a testament to our ongoing uh, efforts to support our members in their sustainability journey. 
This tool is tailored specifically for Islamic banks, enabling them to accurately measure and report their greenhouse gas emissions, thereby enhancing their ability to manage climate risks and size opportunities in the green finance sector. So this webinar will be an opportunity for us to explore how Islamic banks can leverage it <clears throat> to enhance their climate risk management strategies. We will hear our esteemed panelists who will share their insights on the role of Islamic banks in supporting climate action initiatives and strategies for successful implementation. I would like to extend a warm invitation to all of you to join us for our annual general meetings which officially begin tomorrow in uh, Istanbul, Turkey. We will kick off with a workshop on GSG uh, accounting, providing a deep dive, more details into the methodologies and practical applications of the tool we are presenting today. The day after, we will hold our annual general meeting, which you also uh, are welcome to join us. I'm confident the discussions and insights shared during this webinar will not only have enhance your understanding of GHG measurement tool, but also inspire us to take bold steps in integrating sustainability into financial practices. I would like to end by thanking our speakers and experts who are joining us for this uh, webinar and supporting us throughout uh, our activities and initiatives. And warm thanks also to our partners, the Islamic Development Bank and the PCAF for this their support in this project. Together, we can make a significant impact on our environment and pave the way for a sustainable future. Thank you for your attention and I look forward to our discussions. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Belatik. So ladies and gentlemen, before um, welcoming the, the, the distinguished speakers and inviting them to join me in the panel session, allow <coughs> me to um, give you a brief presentation on the SIBAFI uh, GHG uh, measurement tool. Um, in this presentation, I will uh, highlight the main component of this methodology, how it was developed and uh, the adaptation of uh, the PCAF methodology uh, so that we uh, can provide the industry with uh, a measurement tool that can um, uh, that can be used in the context of uh, Islamic uh, Islamic banks. So Sibafi uh, uh, supported by the, the Islamic uh, Development Bank uh, started developing uh, this project of uh, coming up with a GHG measurement and reporting tool for Islamic financial institutions uh, with the aim of aligning uh, this initiative with global efforts like the, the Paris Agreement and also to help assess the GHG emissions uh, in Islamic financial institutions investment portfolio uh, focusing on scope three and also to um, uh, be a stepping stone for, for these banks to create action plans for managing climate risks and uh, um, opportunities and to enhance, of course, the role of the industry in climate action and um, initiatives. And this uh, project supports uh, Sibafi's commitment uh, to promoting sustainability and responsible practices in the Islamic, uh, Islamic finance. Um, this methodology um, or in this methodology, the choice of the um, we actually uh, took into consideration uh, international um, standards um, and uh, uh, methodologies, for instance, the GHG protocol and the PCAF as a reference uh, uh, standard. And the, the, the rationale behind this is that the uh, GHG protocol is widely used and uh, forms the basis for, uh, for example, TCFD recommendations, the PCAF and IFRS uh, S2 uh, standards. Um, why also selecting the PCAF uh, in particular? Because it is well suited, uh, uh, suited for financial institutions. Um, by considering these standards, we ensure that the Islamic banks can accurately uh, measure and report their emissions while aligning, of course, with uh, international best practices. 
and in this approach or uh, this approach that we've adopted brings uh, significant uh, benefits such as leveraging existing knowledge faster time uh, to to market and comparability with conventional uh, finance uh, however we must also address uh, challenges including uh, data quality and availability um, and uh, um, in in the approach that we um, we adopted uh, we um, started by um, uh, um, a mapping the asset classes um, that are uh, used by the PCAF um, standard, adapting measurement methodologies to the Islamic finance. Um, uh, for example, uh, listed equity and corporate bonds in conventional finance um, are aligned with listed equity and sukuk in Islamic Islamic uh, finance. So this adaptation of um, or this methodology of adapting or mapping between uh, the asset classes uh, ensure that the GHG measurement methodology is relevant and applicable to Islamic financial institutions. So the, the proposed methodology, as I mentioned, starts by identifying the most significant asset classes in Islamic finance, then to match these with the PCAF asset classes to identify the GHG measurement and reporting uh, methodology um, that need to be adapted to the context of Islamic finance. And what you see um, in the screen is the list of the asset classes that are covered by our methodology. So the, after the adaptation uh, or in, of the uh, the asset classes or, or the, this uh, mapping process, the, the adaptation covers mainly uh, the calculation of the attribution factor, uh, which depends on the, the, the nature of underlying assets, the structure of the contract, and uh, whether the use of proceed is, is known or unknown. Uh, on the, the reported uh, or uh, uh, on the reported emissions, so there, there are uh, in general three options or three um, approaches to uh, computing finance emissions. So the, the, either we can um, follow the option of reported emissions, uh, and this means that scope one, two, and three resulting from count, uh, counterparty activities, and the potential source of the of this uh, of the data could be uh, national databases or um, uh, data from uh, uh, rating agencies, uh, for example, SMP and uh, and Moody's. On the, the the second option is the emissions or or uh, um, uh, emissions related to physical activities, um, and this means the the. Uh, the scope one and two and three emissions uh, factors uh, per physical activity uh, indicators. Um, and the source of this could be the, the PCAF uh, database, um, as well as uh, any publicly uh, available or private uh, data source. Then we have the third option where we consider uh, sectoral emissions per sector, for example, in uh, economic uh, uh, um, indicators, for example, sector revenue or, or assets. And this means uh, sec uh, sectoral uh, scope one, two and three emissions per generated, for example, revenue or assets. And uh, again, a source of this could be the PCAF uh, database or any other um, publicly available and private uh, data sources. Um, so in, in the process of uh, developing this methodology, I mean, uh, we in, in our in our uh, in the report that will be uh, published in the next few days, of course, we highlight the methodology, how we, the, the emissions should be um, uh, calculated uh, for for dif for different asset classes, but we also identify uh, some um, challenges and we provide recommendations on how to overcome these challenges for a better um, implementation. So Islamic financial institutions should face uh, in general uh, two type of challenges, uh, technical challenges and organizational uh, challenges. So when implementing uh, a GHG um, uh, measurement systems, technical challenges relate to, 
for example, calculating finance GG emissions, data availability, data quality, um, uh, the bank data system and data collection, while the organizational challenges are associated or linked to the lack of internal um, capacity to implement uh, this methodology. So we, we've provided uh, a few recommendations on how to overcome these uh, challenges. For example, Islamic banks um, must explore um, complementary data sources uh, to overcome the challenges of data availability. Uh, they need also to rely on assumptions as an option, uh, although this may, be, uh, may impact negatively the data quality, but it could be a starting point for uh, the implementation of the methodology. Then um, uh, looking at uh, uh, automation and uh, uh, having like a, um, appropriate databases and systems for the calculation. Um, also calculating the emissions will require um, a data collection from several internal and external data sources for the bank. If this process is not automated, so it, it will not um, um, ease the process of, of calculation. Banks can also begin, begin with the, the, the first finest uh, GHG emissions measurement with relatively manageable asset classes. So to gradually start with, with the, the certain selected asset classes that uh, uh, that can be uh, easily uh, managed in terms of GHG uh, emissions and then uh, progressively uh, continue with uh, or add the other the other uh, asset classes. Uh, on the organizational uh, aspect or, or challenges, um, GHG measurement is relatively a new field for for several, I mean, in the conventional sector, but also uh, for several Islamic banks. Um, so the staff, they are not trained uh, on, on this topic. So they therefore there is a need for um, for our to, to equip the staff with the necessary knowledge and skills to participate in the process of GHG measurement through a number of uh, training programs and capacity uh, building programs and also um, uh, exchanging knowledge with with experts and external uh, stakeholders. So uh, this is in general the, um, uh, the, the the summary of of this methodology and more details are uh, available on the, the, the report that will be uh, released in the next uh, next few days. So now uh, to discuss the points related to this methodology and also additional points related to the theme of uh, this uh, uh, webinar, I would like to welcome the, the distinguished panelists and speakers. Uh, Mr. Peter Casey, Sibafi consultant from United Kingdom. Uh, Mr. Numan Ali, managing director financial control or uh, ESG and sustainable finance from HSBC uh, Group United Arab Emirates and Dr. Wail Aminu, managing par partner uh, Green for South Canada and Ms. Sonita Devi, senior uh, sustainability manager uh, from uh, Franken Group Limited in Malaysia. Uh, welcome to all the, the, the speakers and to start the discussion, uh, we will look into the global First, the first point to look at the, the global regulatory uh, perspectives on uh, climate related financial risks. My first question is to Mr. Casey. Could you please um, uh, give us like a, a snapshot of how regulatory bodies worldwide are uh, shaping uh, policies to mitigate um, these risks and also to support the transition to a more sustainable uh, future with some examples if possible? Okay, I'll try. I am, of course, a regulator by background, which is why this is the, the subject in which I'm really interested. And one of the things I need to say at the very beginning is that we need to distinguish two things. The, we need to distinguish between the bank's impact on climate and climate's impact on the banks. Uh, which are often referred to, say, by the Basel Committee as climate-related financial risks. They're, they overlap, and I'll 
come back to why the overlap is important in a minute, but they are different. You can have a bank that is impeccably green in all its activities, that is carbon neutral, but still, if it's in a country that's going to be affected by rising sea levels, adverse weather effects, it is subject to risk. The houses it's financed may be about to be hit by a hurricane. Um, the farmers it finances may see changes in the yields of their crops as a result of climate change. So that is a very real issue and it's the one, that one, the effect of climate on the banks, is the one that prudential regulators have so far focused on. And so you have the Basel Committee, which has produced some principles for managing these things. Um, the IFSB is working on a guidance document based on those Basel principles. Some national regulators have begun to do stress and scenario testing to enable banks to assess the impact of climate risks on them. The other important thing that's going on is that the Basel Committee is also thinking about what the disclosure regime should be for those risks as part of Pillar 3. And that does have an important overlap with what we're talking about. We, of course, are in the other area, which is what the banks are doing to the climate. Um, and indeed, that overlaps with sustainability more generally. And a number of bodies have worked in this area. Rashi named a few in his presentation. Um, but, you know, there's pretty much an alphabet soup there. There are things like the Climate Bonds Initiative, for example. The International Standardization Organization got involved in some standards. A couple of years ago, I think we'd all have said that scene was getting very crowded and confused. And that is why the ISSB was set up as part of the IFRS under heavy pressure, I, I think I can say, from the G20. And some of the other bodies have been folded into it. For example, Task Force for Climate Related Financial Disclosures is now effectively absorbed. So is SSAB. It's clearly the ambition of the G20 and the Financial Stability Board that the ISSB should be the lead standards, should be the leading ones for sustainability disclosures. Um, fortunately, as we've heard, they've been based on the PCAF uh, standards so far as greenhouse gas accounting is concerned. I will make a couple of points on how these impact what banks may have to do, however. One is that it looks as though the A key route for implementation of the ISSB standards will be through capital markets regulators. IOSCO very active in that area. So we may well see those standards implemented first in the typical pattern that capital market regulators take, which is for publicly listed companies. But I think those standards will be also influential in shaping the disclosures that the Basel Committee put forward in the other area I've touched on. And that's because I don't think they will want someone like HSBC, which is both listed and regulated as a bank, having to collect data on two significantly different bases where where the disclosures overlap, which won't be everywhere, but uh, I can see the ISSB standards being influential in for the Basel Committee as well as in capital markets. I'll also make one last remark about capital markets. Capital markets regulators also get excited about greenwashing and how instruments that claim to be beneficial to the climate are structured. That's particularly interesting for the for Islamic banks because we're seeing Islamic banks produce a number of green sukuk now. And that's 
fits very nicely with the Islamic banking model because of the underlying real economic activities and assets. And it's relatively easy for Islamic banks to package up some of their financings and use them as the basis for Green Sukuk. But I think you can expect that people will be looking at those Green Sukuk and saying, well, OK, they claim to have positive or neutral climate impacts. How do we know? Who's measuring it? Do the banks in fact know what the greenhouse gas emissions associated with these activities are or what this activity they are financing will do to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. So I think that's another important reason why Islamic banks need to understand the GHG impacts of what they're doing. I've thought for much too long. Someone else is done. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Casey. I will return to you on the point on uh, of managing climate risk uh, related risks with with some more details. But before that, perhaps with this background regarding what is happening on the regulatory uh, sphere, um, it is perhaps important to discuss the role of Islamic banks in supporting all these initiatives. And uh, my question is to Miss Sunita on drawing. Uh, from the um, from the, the the Malaysian experience, can you um, help us understand how Islamic banking principles can align with sustainability uh, goals and with uh, um, specifically on the, the the climate the climate change uh, um, uh, acts? Over to you, uh, Sunita. If, you, if you can activate your mic, please. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening uh, to everyone here. Uh, thank you, Rashid, for that question. I guess uh, there's something else before uh, I need to correct is that uh, my current avatar is in Franken as the sustainability. Uh, my previous avatar is as a sustainability consultant working with companies who have net zero initiatives and uh, DGSI alignment, so on and so forth. Coming back to the question. Uh, I guess we have to take a look at the way in which Malaysia's Islamic finance landscape uh, started. And I must say it started about 50 years ago where the halal economy started developing under the Prime Minister's department uh, back in 1974. The halal economy in the country was uh, first designed to look into hygiene, F&B, uh, uh, production and consumption, but then it moved into a a large economic uh, value. It provided close to about 3 trillion USD projection uh, come up to uh, 2023. And this was reported by the Association of Islamic Banks and Financial Institutions in Malaysia. So it's a $3 trillion industry right now where most of these uh, businesses would require uh, financing from the Islamic uh, financial institutions. And in the country right now, uh, we have more than 20 financial institutions which are considered Islamic financial institutions. So if you consider the assets for Islamic finance from these uh, financial institutions, you're looking at a projection of 5 trillion USD come 2025, just from these institutions that we're referring to. So from here, uh, we would have a better understanding of where the potential for growth uh, in Islamic financing uh, and Islamic banking products and services, uh, to what extent that can grow in the coming years. Now, uh, let me then bring that down to a, a more regulated perspective from uh, the Bank Negara Malaysia, which is a central bank, and also draw upon the taxonomy from ASEAN taxonomy on sustainable financing, which also again applies to Islamic financial institutions in Malaysia. So critically, most of these financial institutions, of course, the initial stages, they would have started as a traditional mortgage, loan, financing, credit line, uh, products and services. But now we're looking at a digital mortgage. So the transformation of Islamic uh, uh, financial institutions and the services that they offer have actually moved into digital mortgages uh, right here in Malaysia. And we're, and we're also looking into the blockchain and, and other services that is expected to grow further 
because of the regulatory push. And I must say, uh, in Malaysia, <laughs> speaking with the clients I've dealt with before, often they say, you know, my regulatory compliance takes on 90% of my time and the rest of the time I'm actually doing the work that I'm supposed to do. So from here, we understand that the um, push from the top, from the regulators, is a little bit more strict. Let me um, give you the explanation as to how that is. In oh, from the time they started communicating, the Joint Committee on Climate Change um, had a couple of conversations, and this Joint Committee is is under the regulator, uh, the the central bank. So the Committee for Climate Change uh, designed a guiding note, or what we call as a guiding principle, to assess businesses whom they are financing uh, against the do no significant harm uh, and uh, a remedial transition, and if they are in the sin sector, the prohibited uh, sectors. So those guiding principles was the first document or discussion uh, where ESG or sustainability uh, related uh, due diligence is concerned. But moving forward this year, they have made it mandatory that the uh, not the climate solution and the climate adaptation sectors, but more for the uh, do no significant harm and remedial transition sectors. Uh, the Bank Negara has uh, provided a due diligence questionnaire to all banks, including Islamic financial institutions, to understand where the potential for financing is for uh, the customers of these uh, banks, especially the Islamic financial institution. Uh, I think I've spoken a little bit, given a little bit of context, but before I, um, I could probably draw one example. In, in Malaysia, we have one of the first banks in the country that took a go beyond approach uh, and became the United Nations uh, principle of responsible investment uh, signatory. And they did this last year in April 2023. Now, in, in uh, that direction, they had two objectives, uh, two critical objectives. Number one is to ensure that all their future investments have got a social inclusion and ESG due diligence around that area. And they are focused on the sectors of education, um, uh, housing, property development and food security. Whereas for the economic inclusion, they are actually looking at the healthcare, uh, energy, and infrastructure financing. So basically they are setting up a whole uh, ESG due diligence framework uh, in order for them to not just meet the requirements of the UNPRI as a UNPRI signatory and the commitment they've made, but they're also looking at creating a dashboard to develop the ESG risks and GHG risks for uh, their business sectors or for their client sectors. Over to you, Rashid. Thank you, Ms. Sunita. Now, it's good that you mentioned the example from Malaysia, and since we have a banker with us, Mr. Numan, perhaps we can learn more uh, from the, the experience of, of his bank with regards to supporting sustainability, uh, with a focus, of course, on the, the environmental aspect and climate change. Uh, Mr. Numan, over to you. Uh, thank you, Rashid, and uh, uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, so from a bank's perspective, I mean, if you look at the big picture, uh, uh, for us as a society, tackling climate change is one of the most urgent and complex uh, challenges facing humanity anyways. Uh, as a bank, uh, we play a critical role as we want to make financing and investment choices for our customers, which will lead to a mean meaningful impact in emissions reduction in the real economy and not only just our portfolios. So this requires that we engage with our customers on their transitions to help finance decarbonization in the sectors and geographies with the most change ahead. So from a finance emissions perspective, uh, we set targets for finance emissions sectors, uh, which will help decarbonize uh, our portfolios. Uh, as we can see, some of the uh, global banks have started setting finance emissions targets, and we would see that the same uh, is being done across the world in the coming years as banks try to reduce the scope three emissions. Hence, uh, the, the tool which Sibafi is coming up will be very beneficial uh, in relation to this aspect. 
Um, so as a bank, our transition plans is uh, taking into account the aggregation of our customer transition plans, and we are working with our customers to understand where they are uh, 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 coming up with emissions. And then we are doing our own financed emissions calculations to ensure that we can reduce emissions in accordance with any targets which we have set. Uh, it is impo also important to note that uh, from a, a sustainable finance perspective, we also help our customers by providing green loans and sustainability linked loans, which also contributes in our journey towards transition to net zero. Uh, lastly, we also see that many banks are now making sustainability and transition to net zero uh, at the forefront of their uh, uh, agendas and few banks are also including it as core part of their strategies. So if I talk from a HSBC perspective, uh, one of our four corporate uh, strategic pillars, uh, one of them is the transition to net zero. Therefore, banks have a critical role to play in the decarbonization journey and uh, financed emissions calculations and target setting is a key part of how we will help our clients in, in that journey to decarbonize. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Newman. So I will I will uh, highlight just or underline one uh, point from what you have you, you have shared with us on uh, um, setting targets, and uh, this is related directly with GHG uh, measurement. And since we have presented GHG measurement tool of uh, developed by Sibafi, so um, in 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 this context, there is like um, a, a direct link between sitting targets. But before that, of course, we need first to to know um, our our emissions and to measure them. So um, uh, this is uh, which is um, uh, a lead or what which lead us to having like a, a need for a successful implementation. Of, of this methodology. So uh, my question to Dr. Wail, uh, I have highlighted in my presentation some of the challenges, but if you can uh, probably give us um, more details on how to overcome these challenges and what recommendations uh, can be given to, to banks for successful implementation of, of this methodology uh, so that more actions can, can, can follow. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Thank you, Brother Rashid. Before answering your question, let me just take one minute to uh, thank all the Sibafi management and Sibafi team for taking the lead on this uh, discussion on aligning Islamic finance with the sustainability. Uh, we are in 2024, so uh, people, when they hear that, they say, yeah, it makes sense. But uh, Sibafi has been advocating on this for a while. And um, we we we've seen we've seen right now the the fruits of this work. So congratulations to you, to all the CBFI team and management on this. Uh, on the question for for the for the challenges. So you've mentioned a lot of challenges, obviously, but there is a good news. The good news is that we have to start somewhere, and we are now obliged to do everything at once. We can do it progressively. So that's extremely important to to keep in mind. Uh, for instance, when it comes to target setting, yes, we can do it in line with SBTI, but we can also uh, reduce our targets given the level of the infrastructure within the bank and outside the bank when it comes to collecting indicator. Uh, one of the, um, let's say, reasons why Sibafi uh, took this initiative of developing a specific tool for Islamic finance, for Islamic banking institutions, there is the reason that you mentioned uh, brother Rashid initially is that we there are differences in terms of asset classes in terms of a treatment of an ijara of a murabaha and so on that we can that we need to discuss but there is also the issue of the environment where most islamic banks operate environment where we don't have enough data where most regulations are um, at best voluntary and even the ecosystem is not there to support you to produce the green, greenhouse gas reporting. But as we mentioned, we can't start progressively. And one way to overcome the issues that you mentioned about data quality and data availability is, uh, is to, to spot 
uh, what are they we call the carbon hotspot of the portfolio. If we look at a bank portfolio, all asset classes are not the same. So a bank could start, for instance, with real estate, could start with vehicle financing. And as the bank moves into this journey, it's going to improve the internal capabilities. So that's very important. One way also that where banks are facing today when it comes to greenhouse gas reporting and sustainability reporting in general, is that the fact that internal, the core banking systems uh, are not rich enough to produce information. Just to give you an example, suppose a bank finances a, uh, a house, a warehouse or something like that. You don't always find the information about the warehouse in the core banking system. For instance, the area, the nature and so on. You might find it elsewhere in other databases, but within the banking system, the information is not easily uh, accessible. So in terms of automation, there are some issues right there. So one way to reduce the complexity of greenhouse gas emissions is to see how we, the bank can enrich the internal databases, the internal uh, core banking system, so that it's easier to produce um, the, the, the reporting. So that's extremely important. Automation plays a role. So if the bank can automate and collect data internally and externally, it's easier to produce the reporting. Also, uh, the collaboration between banks, because greenhouse gas accounting is not a matter of one bank, it's the entire uh, financial sector that is, in, that, that is supposed to be involved. So having a collaboration between banks as to how we can source collectively data through the banking association, through the central bank, through the securities commission, that, that could be interesting to, to embark into a collective journey because it's not uh, worth uh, the effort if every bank does this because it's, it's, it's can benefit all the, the, entire, the entire ecosystem. Uh, one element also is to sacrifice, and you mentioned that Rashid in your presentation, is to sacrifice quality. And this is okay, in my opinion. As long as we start with something, and we embark to that journey, we can accept to make assumptions. Uh, as you know, assumptions comes, come with errors, but that's okay. As we move, we improve this. So accepting assumptions is one way to overcome the issues uh, and, uh, and improve over time. One element also that we mentioned in the report is the external verification. And it goes back to the points raised by Dr. Casey on the greenwashing. How can we make sure that the this reporting that is produced by the banks are accurate. One way is to, uh, in the regulation, or maybe the bank can take the initiative and say, we are, this reporting has been, have been reviewed, verified by third parties. That adds credibility uh, to the process. So yeah, that's um, overall the um, one of the elements that we can say. And finally, I would like to mention also is that uh, what we've done uh, in this report has two perspectives. There is the, the risk perspective, meaning that we uh, need to anticipate any transition risks where it comes with, with regards to the transition to the green economy, but there is also the opportunity risk also that is uh, present today, meaning that there are opportunities to de decarbonize many sectors, as uh, uh, Nomad said uh, rightly. So the opportunity can drive the bank into advancing this journey of greenhouse gas accounting. Over to you. Thank you, Dr. Wael. Um, and I will give the chance also to Mr. Newman to, to share uh, you, uh, your thoughts on, on this point, um, on any um, strategies that could be uh, implemented by banks for successful GHG uh, um, emissions uh, reporting. Yeah. So uh, the GHG emissions calculation, in particular the financed emissions scope three calculations is a very complex and challenging as well as a new area. So most of the banks who are currently doing calculations, uh, uh, it is a completely new thing for them. So there are various challenges out there. So in my, uh, in my respect, there are kind of three main challenges. One is data, secondly, infrastructure, and third is capability. So from a data perspective, one challenge is that 
the data which is required in the finance emissions calculation is both internal banks data as well as external data such as the client submissions. So uh, most of these uh, data points which are used in the finance emissions calculations are not historically captured by bank as part of their normal banking business. Hence, we have to get a new call a new uh, sources of data. And the challenge with that is that sometimes the quality of data is not good and sometimes the data, especially on emissions, is quite uh, time lagged. So um, generally the data is one year old, two years old. So th th that is one challenge which the industry faces. So as I mentioned that given there are various uh, new data points needed, that creates a, a challenge to get good quality data. So for example, when you are doing a, an emissions, finance emissions calculation on any kind of a government client, uh, maybe if that government is not publishing emissions information as an example, that it might be challenged. So it depends the availability and quality of data. The second challenge is infrastructure. And by that I mean is again, historically banks in their IT systems have not been calculating finance emissions. So again, this is a new area where tools have to be developed, hence the Sibafi tool, which kind of does help in the calculation of, of that. Thirdly, capability. Uh, given that this is such a new area, uh, that is why you have very limited uh, uh, people who have an understanding of how finance emissions calculations need to be done. You need to understand the methodology. You need to understand the concept as well. So that is another thing where we need more and more people who have capability, skill set and the experience to do these calculations. So to address all three, three challenges, the main thing is that it requires investment by the rel relevant banks and firms into their organization to address all of the three matters. From a data perspective, you need new data quality, so you need to ex uh, engage with external data suppliers. On the infrastructure and capability side, you need to invest again to ensure that you are able to do these calculations in a sustainable manner. And then you train up, staff up, and hire new resources to ensure that this can be delivered. So those are the kind of challenges and how to successfully deliver financed emissions. You need to uh, involve these things. Thank you, Mr. Newman. Um, let me now return uh, to the point on the risk management because we we in so I mean in the uh, the contribution from Dr. Wiley he mentioned transition risk um, and I think uh, the risk management is an important aspect of uh, of this journey. Um, so my question to to Mr. Casey, uh, can you please share your perspective on? Um, the, the the list or what are the potential uh, risks that that are related to to uh, to climate and uh, how can bank manage manage uh, these risks specifically within the context of Islamic banking? Okay. okay. The risk management activity, I think, it has been dominantly around the management of so-called climate related financial risks, i.e. what the climate is doing to the banks. And these are classically um, analyzed in two classes. One is physical risks, and that's the sort of thing I talked about earlier, you know, that the houses you've financed may be underwater, um, or that, the farmers you've financed may find that their crop yields are affected by climate change in either direction, by the way. And the difficulty with the physical risks is fundamentally that they are highly specific in both geospatial and industrial terms. You know, and it can very well be that the grain farmers on the plain are seeing their yields suffer as a result of hotter, drier summers. Um, and uh, while the livestock farmers up in the hills you know, are catching a bit of extra rain and you know, their sheep are pretty much dancing in the fields. So the issue for that is data, data, data. The 
The other area of the risk is so-called transition risks. And I think that's where it overlaps rather more with the financed emissions. Um, because the, the fundamental issue is how will values of things change as the country decarbonizes? And there, um, yes, of course, there will be some things that the bank holds purely as investments. And you may hold Sukuk issued by such and such a, an industry. And your concern is how is fundamentally the default risk affected by the changes that are taking place in the country's economy. But you may, but the assets you hold because you finance them will also be affected by transition risks. And there, what, the question will get will be similar, but one of the ways you will be looking at it um, will be what kinds of things are we financing? Are they carbon intensive? What will happen to them in the future? And that's where things overlap with the greenhouse gas tools. If you are in risk management, I think the processes for climate risk management follow the usual principle and, the, and you know, three lines of defense, board oversight, that's critical. If you don't have the involvement of your board, forget it. Setting risk tolerances, setting limits, monitoring limits and so on. Obviously, that needs to be integrated with other kinds of risk management. If you're going to have anything that works, you know, if fundamentally from a climate point of view, you're saying we're getting a bit iffy about financing X. That will need to integrate with other bits of risk assessment, um, for example, about default risks for that industry, about the other things that may affect it, uh, about how you want, about your geographical um, dispersion, of your activities. So risk management will always have to be integrated. Couple of other comments. You, I always say to myself, what's special about Islamic banks in this context? And of course, one bit is the structures of Islamic banking, which is something that the GHG tool has had to think about quite hard. Um, another, however, it, Another in some contexts is the position of investment account holders, because you never want banks to be acting in such a way that crudely they load all the the climate risks onto the investment account holders and yeah use the shareholders money to finance the nice safe things any more than you would in any other area of risk. So you always have to think about investment account holders separately. I think the other thing you need to think about in risk management is that your risk mitigation tools are likely to be different. And in some areas of transition risk, a conventional bank can use capital markets instruments. You know, if they think we are fairly heavily invested in things issued by such and such a, a, a type of industry, we're a bit nervous about how those investments may develop. Well, a conventional bank can take a derivative which will commonly which will give them the effect of a short position in that industry. It's very unlikely that an Islamic bank Sharia board are going to let you let them do that. Uh, note this flags the governance issue of the involvement of the Sharia board in all this risk management, at least in deciding what is legitimate. But it means that you may have to find other ways of mitigating the risk. It may actually mean that the Islamic bank has to change a little more. Two other comments apart from data, data, data. One is that climate risks to banks typically manifest themselves over a rather longer time scale than banks think about capital. Capital regimes are often over the next year, the next three years. Some of the climate risks will take longer to manifest themselves. Transitions will take longer. 
that may, that means that both banks and regulators are probably having to think on a longer time scale than they're used to. Not quite sure whether that answers Rashid's question, but at least there are some points there that may be relevant. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Casey. And uh, Dr. Weil, do you have any additional points related to action plans for mitigating uh, some of the risks, risks that uh, were highlighted by uh, um, Mr. Casey? Thank you. Thank you, uh, Rashid. Um, I think that um, this uh, dichotomy between transition risk and physical risk uh, deserves uh, like a specific report on how to highlight this because the dynamics are not the same. And when you talk to banks and to banks management, they are kind of sensitive to the physical risks because although they take time to materialize, but they're starting to see the effect. And we do see the effect every day with all the floods, uh, droughts and so on. So uh, in terms of financial materiality, so they, they see it right away in their portfolio. So, and therefore they are quicker to act on that front. However, from the transition risk standpoint, yes, there, there are those uh, many countries uh, have committed to net zero. Many banks have done the same, but said we're talking about 2050 in some GCC countries, 2060 and so on. So this is a long time span compared to the like uh, one year, two years objectives or three years of most CEOs. So this is interesting uh, how we can uh, make the urgencies that even transition risks, they do matter uh, as well as the physical risks. So that's very important. In terms of action plan, uh, I think that uh, the key words here are the following. Uh, first of all is that uh, we need to have targets. That's extremely important because if you don't have targets, there is nothing to, to monitor. There is nothing to measure and nothing to compare with. So having targets is extremely important. Uh, not necessarily SBTI targets, but uh, it could be targets that are kind of like uh, feasible for the bank to start the journey and to convince the board to be involved. The second keyword uh, that was mentioned by uh, by uh, by the colleagues is uh, is governance, because we need a strong involvement of the of the board of the committee, so that this is extremely important because there are so much things going on in the bank. And how can we make sure that this is a priority? So that's that's very uh, extremely important. Um, uh, then uh, to the issues that we have discussed in this uh, in this roundtable, uh, I think there are ways, and there are all, there will be always a way to overcome the issues uh, through um, proxies, through estimations, through putting in place the ecosystem, through mobilizing. Uh, bodies like Sibafi and the like, so there will be a way to do so. Uh, but again, if we set the targets, if we incorporate it into the business model, and if we can prove that uh, this gonna affect uh, the the, the PNL of the bank, I think that there are ways to be uh, put in place to make this happen. And finally, uh, uh, regarding uh, decarbonization and refinancing. Uh, there are many banks right now that are struggling to refinance in good terms. Um, green in part of the portfolio can be a way to have uh, access to financing in good terms, either directly through refinancing lines or through Sokoka or the like, green Sokoka and likes, but also it allows also to have a, an additional package in terms of uh, cash back in some programs, in terms of technical assistance and so on. So that could be an additional incentive for banks to embark into this. And uh, the, the assumption for that is that the bank is able to measure for this part of the portfolio, what is the greenhouse gas uh, footprint of the counterparties? Over to you. Thank you, Dr. Weil. Um, so before giving the audience a chance to ask questions, um, I have one last question regarding the, the potential benefits for for Islamic banks in, in in taking steps toward climate action, that starting with measuring and then reporting, uh, setting targets and uh, uh, reduction and positive climate initiatives. Um, so, is there like any uh, uh, benefits 
um, from from this for 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 Islamic banks rather than the reputation and also the further alignment with the core principles of, of Islamic uh, Islamic uh, finance. And uh, perhaps I can start with uh, Ms. Sunita if you have uh, thoughts to share on this point, please. I could draw upon the example of, on a project that we worked on. A couple yeah, of different examples. So I'll start with uh, the first part because this particular organization, it's a supply chain organization. They have a global partner, a dominant global partner, uh, and the biggest customer who has the net zero initiative. So to them, uh, because they are contract manufacturers, they are unable to uh, set net zero uh, targets and ambitions because they have other customers who do not have a net zero ambition. So in that dilemma, uh, this particular organization decided that their biggest scope between the scope one, two, uh, they've, they've not actually accounted for scope three, but just the scope one and two, they found that the scope two uh, is your biggest number. So to reduce that, they approached a financial institution and say, I would like to purchase a renewable energy certificate uh, because that's the only way in which I could meet my client's uh, requirement. So the renewable energy certificate financing uh, was one of the Islamic financing uh, instrument or product. So sometimes in a company, although you want to look into all the transitional activities and decarbonization, each of it has got some capital expenditure, and that's an additional amount of costs, you know, to be able to align. So financing those costs with financial institutions is one of the, I guess, the more easier, a lower hanging fruit for some of the businesses to approach an Islamic financial institution or vice versa, an Islamic financial institution can also approach businesses. Um, in another example, uh, for a haulage company, uh, the number one biggest haulage company in Malaysia, they understood that their prime movers were their bigger contribution to their scope one. And so these prime movers need to be electrified so converting them into uh, EV prime movers, then they spoke to a uh, EV prime mover producer, uh, one of the largest in the in the world. And I guess without the financing from the Islamic financial institution, they wouldn't have been able to pull through that deal and be able to transition their scope one. Because for a, a haulage company, their scope one is their biggest uh, GHG emission. So depending on the business sector, approaching a financial institution to mitigate either scope one or scope two uh, would be a wise move. Now, another benefit in approaching, uh, I mean, with Islamic financial institutions and sustainable financing is the financing of uh, climate related risk reduction or risk mitigation solution. Some companies do not have any risk reduction or mitigation solution because to them, uh, they're just learning about sustainability and ESG. Because of the compliance push, they understand that in their sustainability report, uh, it was not mandatory before, but now it is mandatory to state their scope one and scope two numbers and also their scope three. So as they are learning this, they're working with different vendors uh, with who can offer them those climate solutions. Uh, hence, uh, when you say working with vendors, vendors come with a, a cost, an invoice. Uh, so one way in which a financial institution can support, facilitate is like a sustainable financing is to support those climate related solutions. And one of this is uh, quite obvious in the hydrogen uh, energy production uh, landscape because uh, hydrogen or for the oil and gas sector, hydrogen energy is an opportunity. It's a leverage. It's a new opportunity. But however, the uh, expenditure in getting started is a big budget project. So any big budget projects would mean that they have to go back to uh, their financial uh, institution. The third one is the aligning company. So they may not you have the, the aligned company and then you've got the aligning company, companies that are just starting off to understand what's their scope one and scope two and their uh, kilowatt hours use and so on and so forth. So these companies have, uh, according to their ESG maturity, so it also depends on the company's ESG maturity. And we all talked about the challenges, you know, 
in terms of capacity building, in terms of training, in terms of uh, infrastructure, in, in terms of software. Uh, these are all the challenges and it's inherent to almost all businesses that is now trying to understand ESG and incorporate or integrate ESG in some way in their business. And currently, the only help they have is the financial institution that offers sustainable link loans, so Coke, uh, and, and those financial products, right? So those ambitious, or rather those companies that are in the climate aligning stage, you know, uh, not there yet, but about to get there. So that's another capital expenditure that Islamic finance institutions can finance. The last one would be uh, those which we consider as hard to abate industries. So I can refer to an example, uh, a cement factory uh, understood that it's a hard to abate industry. It's very difficult for them to transition, to decarbonize, and so on and so forth. However, the um, R&D in the sustainability department, uh, the R&D unit said, OK, let's look at what can we do? You know, just like the carbon majors and the oil and gas industry, they said that we can't do anything about this, uh, transitioning because this is the nature of our business. This is our core business. This is our bread and butter. This is what gives us uh, shareholder value and the stakeholder value. So how do we move that? So uh, the cement company, what they did was they approached a, a financial institution, an Islamic financial institution in the country, and they said, I do not know where and what I can transition. So I'd like to know what facilities you have who would you be able to recommend to us to help us with this R&D? Because our sector is a hard to abate sector. So then the memorandum of understanding and the contracts were drawn up to identify a major change in the aspect of material. So uh, they started off with material in the environment, the ESG standards. You have the material, which is the core for a cement uh, sector, because most of the materials are non-green inputs. So the green input material uh, was converted is a product uh, costing for procurement. And this procurement cost was financed partially because of the green concept. It was financed partially by the sustainable uh, financing instrument by the financial institution. So even if it's a phase start, managed phase start session uh, 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 approach or initiative by companies, especially those in the hard to abate sectors, uh, there is still an opportunity, so nothing is lost in in any way. So that's my input, Rashid, and over to you. Thank you, um, Dr. Weil. If you have any additional points, I know that there will be some overlaps on the the benefits, but if you have um, anything to to add, please. No, thank you. Uh, I really like the comment from uh, from Sunita, and uh, the idea of the bank being uh, uh, working close, very closely with clients to decarbonize is very interesting because oftentimes when we talk about the portfolio decarbonize, we see it as a as a block, but uh, a portfolio is composed of small transactions. So maybe pinpointing this like big client, like cement company and uh, and uh, accompanied them through this journey, bringing in financing and also expertise and mobilizing what the bank knows about the topic. Internationally could be it's an interesting idea. Thank you, Dr. Wai. Uh, Mr. Norman, Mr. Casey, do you have any additional points? Can I just um, return to one of the points that was made earlier, which I think is really yes, the, need, the need for Islamic banks to work together and probably to work together with other authorities in the country um, to get the data and the climate impact scenarios that they're going to need. I think if you look at particularly the sort of stuff that comes out of the Basel Committee, it's directed primarily at internationally active banks, people like HSBC, and it assumes that they are fairly big, they are capable, they can get data out of their clients, um, they can construct scenarios and all of those are things you expect. Um, I occasionally look at your surveys and I realize that you have some really rather small Islamic banks often involved in things like agriculture financing um, and with, without 
the sort of capacity that will enable them to do all the things that a big bank can. And they are more dependent on, on partly their regulators to lead them by the hand a bit, um, but also things like banking associations in the country. Mm -hmm. And really for them, I think the ways of overcoming some of the difficulties and particularly the data difficulties will be to work with others and to tell their regulators what they need, particularly by way of, th of things like scenario analyses. Thank you, Mr. Casey. Sir Norman, over to you. Um, yeah, no further comments, Rashid, on me from my side. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you so much. So perhaps uh, I will open the floor for questions from the audience. I can see one question in the in the chat. Um, can you suggest any GHG allocation methods or tool between financial institutions and their counterparts to prevent double, um, I think, double accounting? Um, perhaps Dr. Wiley can address this question. Double counting occurs, and uh, especially when it comes to scope three. Uh, but um, I think the the position of the <laughs> regulators and the position of the of the standard setters is um, is um, is to start reporting and then we figure out how we can tackle this uh, issue of, of double counting. But uh, as soon as you're working on scope three, na natural, naturally you are, in, you are in double counting. Um, mm -hmm. But this is the, uh, uh, it comes to, to bank financing. One way to limit this is, do it, is to do that through the attribution approach that we describe in our documents, meaning you only allocate the emissions to the bank that are financed by the bank. So this is one way, but it doesn't solve the problem. And we, my, my understanding is that we are in the stages that we accept double counting for the time being. And as the market matures, uh, there will be ways to um, kind of neutralize this uh, double counting issue over time. Yeah. And just, just to add to that point, I, I guess uh, we should not look in a way that a company's total emissions will be added with the bank's emissions with another one. We should not look at that. The purpose is that from, from an organization's perspective, how much emissions do they contribute both directly and indirectly? So obviously scope three is indirect. That's why that's just a view of a lens for every firm to see what it's direct or indirect footprint, but it's not about adding it that way. So I think we should we, we can consider looking at it in a different from a different lens. Yeah, thank you. Um, there is another question from uh, the audience on the physical and the transition risks associated with climate change. How uh, can we def I mean make the difference uh, with regards to these two uh, type of risks for small and large Islamic banks. Uh, perhaps Mr. Casey, uh, if you can um, answer this question. Okay, I'm not quite sure whether the um, questioner was asking about how do we draw the distinction between physical and transition risks, or how do they look different for bigger and smaller banks. Yeah, um, I think it's the second point. It's the second one. Yeah. That's not really a function of bank size. Um, it's a function of what the bank is actually doing. And so you can have a very big bank, much of whose funding is to end consumers uh, and does relatively little industry financing. In that case, you're looking at the physical risks probably to the assets that end consumers have. And you're saying, is this bit of the country going to be flooded so that people there are relatively poorer? Um, are the industries in which they work going to be badly hit. So again, people may be relatively poorer. 
you would want the same analysis if the bank were a small one. Again, you can have a large bank which does a huge amount of financing of industry and you then analyse the physical risk to those industries. But there are relatively small banks that are dominantly industry banks and they have exactly the same questions to ask. They may have less data to answer it with than with, but that is the problem that we've discussed many times. Similarly with transition risks, one of the questions is, is how does the country's transition to a low carbon economy or a lower carbon economy impact on the bank? Um, I agree that that will be dominated probably by investments um, and by financings of industry. But again, the questions you're asking are, are broadly the same. If you invest in sukuk that are issued by companies of certain kinds, well, what do the risks associated with those things look like as they make the transition? So I don't think that the transition, the physical versus transition risks, necessarily differ hugely between large and small. They do differ very much depending on what the bank's portfolio is. And of course, the ability to analyze them is certainly different. Yeah, thank you. Um, perhaps another question in the chat. In a country without adequate data capturing management, how can Islamic banks align with sustainable transition? I know that in our methodology, we gave some recommendations uh, on, on this regard, but uh, if you can, uh, Dr. Wa'il, um, I mean, answer this question and also I open the floor to, to the other speakers to, to add on. Mm -hmm. Well, the, <clears throat> thank you, Rashid. Uh, the short answer is there, there is always a way to estimate emissions. Yes, <clears throat> this way will come with uh, some errors, but there will be always a way to do so. And this, that's why it's important to disclose the assumptions and the, the calculation methodology. But, um, if we take, for instance, let's take one example. And uh, Sunita talked about a cement company. Suppose a bank is financing a cement company in a country, <clears throat> and the bank would like to know uh, for a given level of financing, what would be the emissions associated with that, with that financing. Um, and we suppose we don't have any data about this cement company in terms of emissions. The company does not disclose uh, the scope uh, one and two. So what can be done here is that we can use proxies. For instance, if we know the output of this company per year, that can, that can be found in the annual report of the company. So you can say, we don't have the annual report of the company. We can find the annual sales of the company. And based on the, on the sales data, we can uh, figure out uh, a, through a carbon intensity indicator, financial carbon intensity indicator, we can estimate this. Even if we don't have those indicators in the country, we can use a nearby country, we can use another country. So there are uh, ways to do so. Obviously, the best scenario is that when a counterparty reports the emission, so that's the best scenario. But we all know that this is a, this scenario does not happen everywhere and every time. But again, uh, in the report, we gave some uh, approaches in, in how we can estimate uh, emission emissions. And uh, that's again, it's possible as long as we disclose how we got to the estimations. Over to you. Thank you. Mr. Norman or uh, uh, Ms. Sonita, do you have any additional points on this question? I know, thank you. I could add a, a context of an example from a Yes, uh, financial institution in the country. See, not all financial institutions have got their scope one and scope two. Let's be practical. Some of these financial institutions, because there is no mandatory uh, regulatory requirement as public listed companies to provide scope one and two or three, um, they are still at a very primitive uh, uh, time in terms of ESG maturity in trying to understand where this data lies. But 
even if it is a country where there is no mandatory requirement and that the com uh, the particular organization uh because it's a financial institution, so I'm saying it's a can Islamic bank. So if it's a financial institution, they are regulated. So it's either the central bank regulatory that provides a, a series of reporting, which is only accessible to their internal staff. So if you are part of the Islamic uh, bank's uh, staff member, then it will be good for you to reach out to the department that provides compliance and regulatory uh, reports to the regulator because that is where the data may lie and that data is not uh, disseminated to all HODs in the bank. Uh, so that's one way in which we can approach this to find that data and sometimes you have to dig much, much deeper. Thank you, Ms. Sunita. <laughs> I think there is one last question. Um, so the question is, will the implementation of um, these kind of tools for uh, JSG measurement um, could significantly increase operational costs for Islamic or uh, financial institutions in general? And how to how can we manage this? I mean, this will be like a challenge. But uh, if, if yes, is there like ways to, to manage it? So, um, uh, yes, so this, the short answer is yes, because this is a completely new area of calculations, uh, the financed emissions calculations, and you can consider that a bit similar to how you do your risk weighted assets calculation, the RW calculation. So a new area, complex area, which will require data, which you will need to pay for, you would need capabilities. Uh, so in short, yes, it, it will require uh, investment. And we also see, as, as Peter uh, mentioned earlier, that uh, Basel is coming up with their uh, requirements, uh, as well as what we have seen is globally, various regulators are already ask, asking for finance, in, uh, finance emissions information in the regulatory return. So you can see this uh, as an additional regulatory requirement. Thank you, Mr. Norman. Um, any additional I, point from the? Oh yes, yes. Rashid. I'd like yes, to please. add a point. As much as ESG can be uh, quite a pain for a lot of organizations, the minute the chairman makes a statement that we have an ESG direction, we have a net zero ambition, we have a carbon neutrality goal, or uh, we are currently looking into a digital automation of our ESG data for. Uh, scope one, two, and three. The minute those sort of uh, investor related information gets onto the public domain or onto social media, the uh, shareholder price will immediately rise a little bit. So there'll be some spike because of this positive outlook and approach towards uh, sustainability. So if you look at the Comparison dollar to dollar value, shareholder pricing value, as opposed to a capitalization value, as opposed to the cost of compliance. I think in some banks, that's probably a negligible cost. It's just my professional opinion from what I've noticed so far. Thank you, Ms. Sunita. So, Casey, Ms. Sunita, uh, Dr. White, any additional points? Okay. No comment from my side. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, ladies and gentlemen, we have now come to the end of our webinar. Uh, we would like to thank uh, all the speakers that have joined us today for their uh, valuable insights shared and the fruitful discussion, the engaging session uh, that covered various aspects of this topic. We would like to thank the audience and the participants for their attention and for the active participation. Uh, please visit Sibafi website and follow us on our social media to be updated on the Sibafi activities and the initiatives, um, e, uh, including the, the, the report on the G, Sibafi GHG uh, emissions measurement tool. We thank you again and we look forward to uh, seeing you in our future events. Uh, thank you and uh, have a very good day ahead. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.